everybody. Welcome to another board game breakfast with the Dice Tower. Well, this is our last week of the Dice Tower Kickstarter. And for all those of you who have pledged so far, a very big thank you to you. There is a lot that we're looking forward to doing this year. And of course, I say that it being this year already. So there's a lot coming out. But there's a few different rewards left. And if you haven't got around to going over there, you say, I'm going to go check it out. Well, go ahead and check it out now. But even if you don't want to, we are perfectly content the fact that you watch our show and hopefully that you enjoy it. So anyhow, here we go. Board game breakfast. The first thing, of course, as always, is the news. announced some games that are coming out in a few months. The first is a party game called Spit It Out. Uh, Spit It Out has the concept of shouting out some a wrong answer to a question. So if I say, what's a, a, a good topping for pizza? You would shout out um, uh, peanut butter. You would have to say, say something that's wrong. Um, and so but you want to say something that's right. I thought that was interesting. Then uh, Cup a Cup, which takes, uh, obviously, the whole cup stacking craze, some sort of game building that. And Caffeine Rush, which is not the first game about baristas, but considering how, much, how important they are in most people's lives, there probably should be more games about this. BoardGameTables.com is a new competitor to Geek Chic. The, the, the difference between them and Geek Chic, Geek Chic are the folks who made my table, is Geek Chic will customize your table exactly how you want it. Uh, Board Game Tables has two tables, and a hexagonal table and a square table, and you pick which one you want. Their advantage, they are less than half the price of a Geek Chic table. Still fairly expensive. WizKids has announced more delays with some of their products. Not major delays, but again, this whole West Coast uh, th problems on the, in the United States has been delaying quite a few things. Mayfair has announced International Catan Day in 2015, on April 24th. Apparently, they have a convention, Catan Con, that's happening at the Gaylord in Nashville. Um, this is another example of companies now running their own con. I know Kuhlman, you're not, does it? Now we have Mayfair doing it. Will this become something around the nation, this Catan Day? Who knows? I mean, how many different days? I mean, yeah, one of these days we're going to say there's a Dice Tower Day. Um, Wizards of the Coast has announced a Temple of Elemental Evil, another Dungeons & Dragons adventure system. I have um, a couple of them right here. You can't see them on the shelf, but uh, Wrath of a Shardlon is one of the games in this series, and this one's supposed to be compatible with these, a cooperative game going through, so that looks good. I did think that WizKids was doing this. I'm not sure what's happened there. And here's a picture of the box cover for the new Fire and Axe game coming from IDW. Now, this is interesting because this was originally done by Asmodee. It's one of the first games that put Asmodee on the map production-wise. They've dropped that. I was never a big fan of this game. Sam Healy was. Uh, but that's a really cool-looking cover. So we take a look at another shelf in my collection. This one has a lot of two-player games in it. Now, interestingly enough, we have here some of the Cosmos two-player games. Actually, just a few of them. Cosmos made a whole pile of two-player games back in the, starting from the 90s and going through the aughts, and there was quite a few of them, uh, and I liked many of them. I hated some, but I liked many of them. But when it comes down to space, I only kept a few of them. So I have here, on, on, and, and there's a couple on other shelves. I've lost cities on another shelf. But I, I kept Heave Ho. I love the silly theming of the tug of war, and it's very easy. Starship Catan is a great underrated game. I have no idea why Mayfair does not reprint this one when they reprint so many of their other games. This one is fantastic. Two-player game, at and it allows you to trade in a decent way. And then Babel, which is the meanest one. This one was reprinted at one point. Then the other ones here feel like two-player Cosmic games, but they're not. Asante, which includes Jumbo, so I have both of those in that box. The Lahav, the Inland Port, and Agricola, all creatures great and small. Both of these I like, and I think they're fun two-player games. But I think if push came to shove, I might get rid of both of these because I am willing to play Lahav with two players, and I'm willing to play Agricola, or Caverna now, with two players. So that, that might be redundant keeping those. My Happy Farm, on the other hand, this one I like quite a bit. It's a fun... Uh, family game about building long pigs and long cows. Great fun. And Jaipur is another great two-player game here that's often compared to Jambo or Asante, the mixture. I don't know. I think I like this one a little bit better, but I like them both enough to keep them. And then this black mysterious box here is just a special collector's box that I showed on the Board Game Breakfast 
I don't know how long ago I showed it, that basically has all my Netrunner cards in it. It's getting a little dusty. Don't play Netrunner very much, so I don't know how long this one is for my shelves either. But that's another shelf. A lot of board gamers out there don't really understand the need for board game cafes. Even four years later, we still see tons of comments on Reddit and Yelp and other websites that say stuff like, why should I pay $5 to play games at a board game cafe when I can play at home for free? Your latte, sir. Thank you, John. Mmm. Delicious. Can't get that at home. There are lots of reasons to go to a board game cafe, from uh, something as simple as not having to prepare your own food and do your dishes, to being able to try before you buy. As the curator, game maintenance is primarily my duty, but my gurus help out whenever their other duties aren't keeping them busy. Boxes deteriorate, dry erase markers and other writing tools run out, sand timers break and the electric ones run out of batteries, and pieces go missing all the time. It's our job to make sure that our games are usable at all times for all our customers. Missing pieces are the bane of a game guru's life. If Lords of Waterdeep is missing a couple of orange cubes, it isn't the end of the world, but Scrabble can be ruined by just a couple of missing letters. Newcomers are often overwhelmed by the selection, and experienced hobbyists want an expert opinion on what is new and worth trying, or what older games they may have missed out on. When you have chest pains, you get a doctor's opinion. When you want to know what to play, you need a guru. More than one regular sits down and simply asks Steve, what am I playing today? And I'm happy to tell them. Sure, we get some customers who all they want to do is play games that they already know, but most people, when they come to a game cafe, they're going to end up learning something. Frankly, between most people's difficulty in learning a new game just by reading, and the fact that, let's face it, a lot of rule books are really poorly written, there is nothing better than having someone who knows the game inside and out teach it to you. So, the next time you're thinking, ah, I'll stay home and play some games, maybe, just maybe, think about going to your local game cafe and let them do some of the heavy lifting for you. Cheers. Robert Searing from Insert Me has made me another insert here. This one is for Caverna. Ca Caverna has a lot of different pieces in, and so we take out all the different boards and the rule books on top, and you can see here. Now, one of the things you need to note here about my Caverna is that I have different pieces than come in the original game. I kept some of the stuff, but I traded out the pumpkins for carrots. I put in uh, different cows. These are from Meeple Source. I had to put in different uh, pieces of wood. And um, then if you look at the, the, other, the other container here, you can see that I've included different things here also. Um, I use some of the stones and different food pieces. And this, he even has these, these come out, these container pieces here like this. And he has two more that I took out because my stuff didn't fit in exactly. But if you use the stuff that came in the Caverna box, it will fit in very well. The, for me, the most important thing about this insert in particular is these tiles. These tiles were a real pain in the neck. And I actually, even with my upgraded pieces, was still able to fit everything in except for the cards. So I have the cards uh, just laying flat in the box on the top. I, I split them into two decks to do that. I could have, if I, maybe I could have moved some stuff around. The cards are supposed to go in this section, which holds them even if they're sleeved. But still, everything here fits very nicely. And of all the games I need organized, this is certainly one of them. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. I'm a big fan of trick-taking games, but I've seen my fair share of cruddy ports and variants created over the years. Designer Jay Treat decided that he had something to add to the genre, so he created Cahoots. Let's take a quick look at this six-suited trick-taking game. Cahoots is played with a modified deck that contains six suits with cards numbered four through eight. You are randomly assigned three of the suits that you will score on, and the goal is to play cards that ensure the point value of the trick is the highest in a suit you own. Others have a mix of the suits as well, so there's an interesting element of random team play, where in one hand you're working with the person on your left to build up stars, but the next hand you may want to support the person across from you to build up diamonds. 
Aside from the unique suits, the other twist in the game is at the end of a hand, you take turns selecting one card from the table to return to your hand and one to discard from the game. For every trick your suit wins, you get a couple of points, and of course, most points wins. I like the unique gameplay elements in Cahoots. Unfortunately, the app itself is missing some features I really wish it had. The built-in tutorial walks you through the gameplay well, but it's pretty bare bones, and you basically have to click through it if you want to look up a rule, so a quick rules page would have been great. The design and interface are very simple and functional, the benefit being that everything is easy to see and read. There are multiple levels of AI, and you can select a three- or four-player game. The AIs are actually pretty challenging, and the fact that the number of cards varies by player count probably helps balance the game. But there is no online or pass and play, and this game feels like it would be greatly enhanced by being able to play against others. There are some neat twists and cahoots that trick-taking fans should probably take a look at. It's a good challenge to figure out when you can dump high cards of a suit you don't want to score, and I like the choices you have to make when you're choosing to draw or discard from the table. The fact that this game is from a small independent designer and developer also helps soothe some of the feature wishes I might have. Give it a try. Folks, if you missed it last week, Sam Healy and I played Memoir 44 live through, so you can see that. Well, hopefully we'll do some more live things this week. If anything, we'll be doing a live question and answer time today at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so 4 o'clock. If you want to ask me some questions, you can come and ask then. I'll be doing a few reviews this week. I missed a few that were supposed to go up last week, so those will be coming out this week. But other than that, I'm going to be doing some other kinds of videos. Uh, there'll, there'll be... Well, you know what? I don't really want to spoil them because I have several of them planned and I don't know how many I'll get done this week. So let's see how many I can get finished and post it. And hopefully you guys will enjoy those. We have some content that is being produced this week on the Dice Tower channel. If you missed it, also there's all kinds of podcasts that have gone up. Last week I finally got up an episode of The Dice Steeple, which has been, it's been a long time since one of those has gone up. And But I have some more of those in the can, so hopefully that podcast will get back to being regular. And The Dice Tower Next Gen with Melody Vassal got another one of those episodes put up last week. So you can find all that information about the different podcasts at Dicetowernetwork.com. Okay, of course, jazz. Oh, hello. Hey, uh, I'm joined today by a portion of the not yet played games in my collection. And as my collection has slowly grown over the last few years, I, I didn't really noticed just how many of them had yet to hit the table until I recently actually stopped and paused to think about it specifically. And while the percentage of games in my collection that I need to catch up on may be higher than the average player, at least I'm not alone. A recent unscientific poll that I conducted online suggests that the average gamer that responds to unscientific polls online has an average of 105 board games in their collection, and on average, 18 of them are unplayed, or 15%. So with so much untouched cardboard accumulating, why do we continue acquiring games, continually increasing this pile of play potential? Well, some may suggest that we buy games for their components or miniatures, or because it fills a gap for a game with a certain mechanism that's missing from our collection, or simply because it's on sale. But no. No, 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 no. Well, maybe just a little bit. But no. Those analytical reasons aren't why people buy games. It's not why people buy anything. Every game in my collection was purchased for the same reason. One reason. Because a little thought bubble appeared in my mind, picturing someone I know enjoying it. My best friend would love this. My game group would think this is hilarious. Oh, my daughter and I would have a great time sharing this one together. And that's why, even with this embarrassing abundance of unplayed games already in my collection, if a new game triggers a thought bubble of a friend and I exclaiming, This is awesome! Then, inevitably, cha-ching, out comes the wallet. Because the urge to buy something emotionally fulfilling is stronger than the logical rationalization not to. So, how do we prevent ourselves from purchasing a 
board game before we've played all the other ones already in our collection? Well, it's simple. We don't. In my opinion, if it's within someone's budget and it'll give them enjoyment, then go for it. The, the thing to be aware of is that the joy that I'm anticipating that this game will give me is, is just a shadow of its potential until it's actually played. Transforming that imagined gratification into actual experiences by sharing these games with the people in my thought bubbles, that's the step that should not be neglected. And based on the size of these piles, uh, it looks like I need to make some phone calls and set up some game time. And welcome to the Discriminating Gamer. My name is Cody. If you're like me, sometimes when you play board games, you, you really, really get into it. They can be very stressful when you're playing them sometimes. Uh, there's games I play where my heart is beating, my, my, my head, my hands are sweating because I'm so into the game. And it gets so intense. And I find some of the most tense games I play, some of the most stressful games I play, are hidden trader games. Like uh, Battlestar Galactica, The Resistance, Shadows Over Camelot. These kinds of games really, really, really uh, get me going. But I gotta tell you, far and away, the most stressful game that I play is Letters from Whitechapel when I'm playing Jack the Ripper. Because in this game, Jack the Ripper commits his crime and he's only got so many turns to make his way home. And he's got to go through all of these cops, because if these cops find him, then they're going to arrest him, he's going to lose the game. So Jack has got to make a choice. Does he take the direct path directly to his hideout and risk detection by the cops, or does he take a longer route and risk running out of time? He can lose either way. And my heart's pounding every single time I play that. It's it's Man, I swear I'm going to have a heart attack one day playing that game. That's how intense this game is. So my question is, what is the most stressful game that you play? I want to know. Leave a comment. Let me know what the most stressful game you play is and why it's so stressful. What makes that game stressful? Because what I find is, a lot of the time, stressful games are my favorite games. This is Cody with The Discriminating Gamer. Y'all come back now, you hear? Please somebody help me on my feet again. Nick mentioned the exploding success of Exploding Kittens, uh, which is a Kickstarter making 3.8 million at the time of me doing this with almost 100,000 backers uh, based on the oatmeal comic strip slash informational posters. It's, it's a very unique website, but obviously has a lot of people very excited about that website and excited about this Kickstarter. Now, as a Kickstarter that has a meteoric uh, rise like this and just, it's doing amazing, it's certainly something we should look into and the game doesn't look very good at all. And I'm already seeing quite a few threads and different things where people are saying, what is wrong with people? Why does this do so well? And other Kickstarters don't do very well. Well, I think part of that can be traced back to the fact of what hamburger sells the best in America. It's the McDonald's hamburger likely, or the Burger King, I, I don't know what it is, but it probably isn't a really great hamburger that I've had somewhere, you know, at, at Mom Pa's Diner, that was just amazing. That's just the way things work in the world. Things will do very well, whether or not you think they're quality or not. Thus again, much of reality TV, much of TV in general, and so on. You know, that's why great shows that we like get canceled. But at the same time, I think a lot of times when we see the success of things like this, I mean, what is one of the most successful games that sold is LCR. And I get kind of a little irritation when I walk into a store and I see a store has nothing to do with games like Party City. I go into Party City and I'll see LCR sitting there. Why are they selling LCR? Does, do, do people not know how bad this is? My mind just starts, you know, what's wrong with them? Or when I go to the stores and, you know, no matter how much we speak out against Monopoly, still being sold to the different versions of it, more and more versions. Or yet another game that's based on some movie or something becomes very popular. So we can look at this and we can go, rah, rah. now part of that can be sour grapes, right? I mean, we can look at this and say, I wish my Kickstarter had done so well. Now, 
probably not everyone has their own Kickstarter, but we can look at a Kickstarter that I really liked. Why doesn't that do well? Why does Exploding Kittens have to get the one that's four million? Why can't it be something that's a gateway game for everybody? Why can't one of those make four million? Well, I don't think we should be upset at the success of Exploding Kittens and the like. First of all, it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's not like people are investing in that game who would have invested in a different game. I mean, there's 100,000 backers. I don't know that any Kickstarter uh, for board games has even come close to that. Even the ones that went crazy, usually the very high Kickstarters in board gaming are because the people have thrown a lot of money into them, right? Like something like Zombie Side, where people are throwing three or $400 pledges in them. I mean, we just passed 3,000 on our Kickstarter, and I'm like a gog, like, I can't believe that many people. It's not even close to 100,000 people, right? So we look at 100,000, we're like, wow, but most of those people aren't board gamers. So they're not, you're not being taken away from Patrick. They're all these people who aren't even, you know, it's not like these games are losing out because of it. And in fact, it might help them in the long run because some of those people might play the game and they'll say, oh, that's interesting. What other games out there? They'll go look and they'll find other great games. So to me, that seems like a win-win. Besides, people are getting exactly what they want. They want something that's funny-ish, like the oatmeal comics are, and the, they want the card game about exploding kittens and what have you, and they're going to get that. Now, of course, this could have a negative effect on people, which would be like maybe the Kickstarter project just doesn't get things delivered on time, the game isn't bad, they sit there and go, Bleh, I'll never play board games again. But probably they weren't going to play board games anyway. And if they don't like Kickstarter as a result of what's going on, well, that's bound to happen by them running into some bad project anyway. So... I think we have to be very cautious about railing against giant successes like these because it's kind of cool to hate something that's mainstream. Like, ah, oh, well, that's dumb. Now, granted, I think, personally, the game does look dumb. But to, to kind of sniff at it derisively, first of all, we, we look snobbish doing it that way. And secondly, it's, it's really, while it's news and it's the biggest board game project that's ever been kickstarted, and it will be that way for a while, and it will break records, and we'll probably be talking about it for a while, but it really doesn't affect our hobby that much. So, and then the Kickstarter thing is still changing and growing. Like I said last week, three new publications, AEG, Mayfair, and Stronghold Games, all jumped into the Kickstarter, and they're all doing fairly well. Still not sure where Cones of Dunshire is gonna end up, but the other ones are gonna do well, and, we're, and Player and Entertainment now has entered the Kickstarter scene. So this is really interesting to see where this is going to go, but a big, giant project like this is a media thing. It's big, it's gonna make a lot of news, and in the long run, it will go away like everything else. So, eh, I wouldn't worry so much about success of something like this. As it is, the board game hobby is doing very successfully at the moment, and we should be happy about anything that helps bring some more attention to us. Hi, I'm Ian from Open Box Games Jr. And welcome to Component Moment. And today we're going to take a look at Crossmaster Jr. Hmm, something sounds familiar. Number four! My number four is Crossmaster Jr. Well, enough of how good it is, the components you want to see, of course. So let's open the box. Components, components, where do we start? Then I'll start with the miniatures. There's four miniatures with their own totem and pets. What's next? Oh, the boards. There are two boards with two sides. That makes four boards. Crazy! It comes with four adventure notebooks. That's one for each character. And it tells you the rules in each adventure. Also, it comes with cards for each character for Crossmaster Arena. Custom dice, tokens, so many components. <sighs> You gotta check it out. So I mean from Open Box Game Junior. So see you next time. Bye. So if you caught a lot of the 2014 year in review stuff on the Dice Tower, you'll notice that one of the prevailing topics was the idea of board games becoming more mainstream. 
Cited highlights were Will Wheaton's tabletop and the presence of board games in stuff like the movie Gone Girl. If you haven't seen it yet, there's some identity theft and a lot of things get bought in Ben Affleck's name and stuffed in the shack. And then later on in the movie, he goes and opens up the shack and sees everything. And there's uh, some board games in there too, namely a copy of Dominion and Race for the Galaxy. It was really a surprise to me when I was sitting there in the theater and I saw it because I thought, hey, that's my boys up there. So if you really wanted to show that Ben Affleck was getting ripped off and having all his money stolen, then the stuff that would have been bought in his name would have been X-Wing miniatures and Magic the Gathering. Jay Tummelson with Rio Grande Games said on the record that this was part of an aggressive marketing campaign on their part to get board games seen in a more wider audience. But how mainstream could board games really get in the film or television industry? I mean, as we know, Hollywood is bankrupt for ideas, right? But could there be a major film about a board game? The answer is probably no, not because it's infeasible, but because they tried that recently and it failed. The movie Battleship cost $209 million to make, but made only $65 million in the United States. No one looked at that and said, yes, board games, that's the future, the way they did in 2002 when Spider-Man came out. And everyone said, hey, let's start making movies about superheroes all the time. A vintage Ameritrash game that everyone knows, Battleship didn't even own its own brand. No one used the phrase, you sank my battleship. You have sank my battleship. And no one even had the decency in the promotional materials to use a phrase like, this ain't no game. So given that, I don't think we'll see any more movies made about board games. But we might, because there has been one notable instance where a movie was made on a board game and it has had a wonderful legacy. But we'll talk about that next time. Well, 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 folks, that is another board game prefix. I'm super excited. I got some, well, I can't tell you why I'm super excited, but there's some cool things coming up. Uh, I've been working last week on a lot of plans for Gen Con. I know it seems early, but there's a lot going on. Blah. Uh, I should have mentioned that in the news, just all the hubbub over the, the today, I know they opened a housing, uh, or it was yesterday, Sunday, they opened a housing for Gen Con, and wow, it didn't seem to go very well at all. So maybe my first, pr one of my predictions is that everyone will be complaining about Gen Con, maybe that will come true, uh, and I don't hope, I don't hope so, uh, but... We'll see what happens. But anyway, I've been making a lot of plans for Gen Con and the different conventions throughout the year because we're trying to nail that stuff down now. But oh, anyhow, hey guys, always let us know your comments about the stuff in the video. Let us know what you think, good or bad. And again, remember, it's your last chance to check out the Kickstarter this week. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching the Dice Tower Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.